Why have a chainsaw class? In order for volunteers to use chainsaws or large tooth crosscut saws while volunteering, they must receive training and become certified in the use of these tools, just like any Forest Service employee. All Sawyers must be certified in basic first aid, CPR, and bloodborne pathogens. Once certified, it is the responsibility of the Sawyer to maintain records of all completed Sawyer training and certifications they have obtained. First aid and CPR training shall be conducted using the conventional methods of training, such as lecture, demonstration, practical exercise, and examination, both written and practical. In general, first aid and CPR cards are good for two years, and bloodborne pathogens are good for one. You may not take the first aid and CPR class online and have an online card. That's not allowed, but you can have a bloodborne pathogens online card. At the completion of this course, students will be able to define and apply chainsaw safety standards as required by OSHA and agency handbooks, manuals, directives, and owner's manuals. Identify and demonstrate basic chainsaw operation, troubleshooting, maintenance, and safety features. Field proficiency. Instructors will work with students using the techniques from the course in a field environment. Students will perform limbing and bucking operations under the guidance of a qualified instructor certifier and will be evaluated on their skill level. The completion of classroom field proficiency and evaluation requirements may result in certification, certification with restrictions, or no certification. Classes of certification. Class A, Basic Sawyer. Saw operators are individuals that are qualified to brush, buck, limb, or fall material no more than 8 inches in diameter. They may only use a saw under the supervision of a qualified B or Class C Sawyer. Class B Intermediate Sawyer. Intermediate saw operators that are qualified to buck and fall timber 24 inches in diameter or less. Additional restrictions may be imposed as deemed necessary by the certifier. Regulations and standards. Different agencies have different safety regulations based on their policy requirements. OSHA regulations may apply to certain students. Regulations and standards. Forest Service students refer to the Forest Service Health and Safety Code Handbook FSH 6709.11. Motorized tools are prohibited in wilderness unless a chainsaw exemption is given. Job Hazard Analysis Risk Assessment. Depending on your agency, you will use either a Job Hazard Analysis JHA or a Risk Assessment RA. In the Forest Service, we use AJHA. The Job Hazard Analysis describes the potential hazards of the work site, along with all agency policies, controls, and work practices selected to minimize those hazards. A JHA covers the task or procedure to be accomplished, the hazards associated with the task or procedure, abatement actions to mitigate hazards, first aid and emergency evacuation plan and procedures, and PPE. Job hazard analysis, a systematic process of identifying safety and health hazards associated with the project and the development of abatement actions for those hazards which results in documentation. The JHA for that activity must be approved by a line officer and be reviewed and signed by all volunteers participating in that activity. 
Emergency evacuation plan. You must know the frequencies and phone numbers. Know latitude and longitude. Be aware of updates to plan, when work location changes. Ensure proper vehicle egress. Understand the JHA and have required documents on site. An individual or sponsored group agreement must be in place in order for volunteers to work. The crew leader is responsible for making sure that each volunteer signs the sign-in form given to them by the district. The crew leader reads and reviews applicable job hazard analyses before work begins. Crew members who will be exposed to any hazards addressed in the JHA must sign that JHA. That includes crew members working around livestock. In addition, the emergency evacuation or medical plan is with them at all times. In the event of an accident, you must report it to your Forest Service supervisor as soon as possible. They will ask for your sign-in sheet and sign JHAs and fax those documents to Forest Service offices in Albuquerque, New Mexico. You and your crew members will be interviewed about the accident by Forest Service staff. The tailgate safety session. Before work begins, crew leaders are required to conduct a tailgate safety session. During that time, an overview of the project is given, the emergency evacuation plan is reviewed, communications and first aid leaders are assigned. On this day, the district ranger Roy Morris and Helitech crew member Corey Finneman worked alongside volunteers in the field. Like in all working situations, when your boss works alongside you during the same labor that you do, it earns respect. Volunteers came away from this project knowing that their efforts are noticed and that the Forest Service cares about their trails. On districts where no volunteer has ever met the Forest Service in the field, the Forest Service is generally not as well respected and volunteers are more likely to disregard their rules and regulations. The tools. Crew leaders should make an inventory of the tools before setting out. Review how to safely use and work around each tool during the tailgate safety session. Ensure that each crew member has the proper PPE, including hearing protection for chainsaw operators and swampers. Always carry chainsaw spares. Use checklists. Carry spare gloves. Assign tools based on certifications, ability, and the volunteer's desire to use or not use that tool. Establish the last crew member out and who will be responsible for ensuring that everyone is out and that all tools are collected. OSHA regulations for loggers require that all sawyers have a Type 4 first aid kit. Project Activity Level, PAL. Project Activity Level, or PAL, is a decision tool designed to help fire and timber resource managers establish the level of industrial precaution for the following day. This tool utilizes outputs from the National Fire Danger Rating System. When volunteers run chainsaws and clearing or brush saws in LPNF, we must check the PAL in order to determine if we can use the saws that day. To check the PAL, call the Los Padres Communication Center or go to the website listed there and select Predictive Services and select Daily Indices. What each PAL level means to volunteers. A and B, you may run saws all day. C, you may run saws until 1 p.m. D, you must receive permission from the district ranger in order to run saws that day. This permission must be given in writing. An email or text message is okay. E and EB, you may not run saws that day. Sawyer should carry a means to put out a fire should one start, such as a fire extinguisher. They should wait an appropriate amount of time before leaving the work area 30 minutes in order to make sure that they have not started a fire. Motorized vehicles move quickly and often multiple trails are done in the same day. It is important that when working in multiple teams, each team have a first aid kit, form of emergency communication such as a radio or satellite phone, maps, and emergency evacuation plan. No crew member should leave the project early without notifying the crew leader. On this day, the Forest Service led a well-organized project. Maps and radios were given to each team. 
trails were assigned so that we knew where team members would be. Meeting up and regrouping before taking on new trails allowed us to verify that team members were safe and accounted for. The weather. Always carry multiple sets of dry gloves when working around wet conditions. Cold wet hands and chainsaws do not go together. Wet trees could be hazardous to the sawyer. Consider making a no-go decision. Off-highway vehicles can also cause considerable damage to trails in wet conditions and stock can post hole it. Carry emergency rain gear and a jacket. Review the unpredictability of mountain weather with your crew before they leave home. Make sure that they bring clothing that is suitable for sudden adverse weather conditions. Most chainsaw injuries are to the left side of the body. Personal protective equipment or PPE for chainsaw sawyers includes a hard hat, eye protection, hearing protection for you and those around you, gloves, long sleeve shirt, chainsaw chaps, and eight inch or higher boots. The rest of the crew needs similar PPE on, except they do not need to have the chaps. Their boots don't need to be as high, and if you're not running saws, they do not need hearing protection. Remember that when you work for the Forest Service, you are a temporary employee, and you're covered under workman's compensation. You sign a job hazard analysis, and you agree to follow the requirements for Sawyers. You're really no different than any other Forest Service Sawyer. Sometimes organizations have photos that appear on social media that show crew members not wearing PPE and they have sometimes been suspended from being able to work on trails by the Forest Service that negatively affects the image of all volunteers. How chainsaw chaps protect the user. When a saw chain strikes the chaps, Kevlar fibers are pulled into the chainsaw's drive sprocket, slowing and quickly stopping the chain. Chaps should meet the current specification USFS 61704F or later. Chaps meeting USFS specification 61704F or later have leg width of at least 14 inches, black colored webbing and trim, and are labeled with specification number 61704F. Inspection and Replacement Replace chainsaw chaps when the outer shell has numerous holes and cuts. Wood chips and sawdust are evident in the bottom of the chaps. Repairs have stitched through the protective pad. Cleaning has been improper. Do not bleach. High pressure or machine washing has destroyed the protective pad. The chaps have a cut more than one inch long in the first layer of yellow Kevlar. Chainsaw Parts, Maintenance, and Operation Unit 2 Objectives 1. Identify basic chainsaw parts, adjustments, troubleshooting, maintenance, and chainsaw safety features. 2. Demonstrate maintenance tasks required for chainsaw operation. 3. Demonstrate chainsaw transporting and starting procedures. 4. Demonstrate the use of tools and supplies that support chainsaw operations. Chainsaw parts. The bar and chain are the most important parts of your chainsaw. A sharp chain and clean bar equals less fatigue and greater safety. Depth gauge. The depth gauge rides on the wood and controls the depth at which the cutting corner bites into the wood. How a cutter works. The depth gauge, or raker, determines the depth of the cut. The cutting corner severs cross grains. The top plate chisels away fibers. Types of saw cutters. Chipper, chisel, semi-chisel.
Oregon also makes a reduced weight bar. Drive link it draws oil from the bar groove to lubricate the chain and fits into the sprocket to be driven by the power head. The titanium Sujihara bar is extremely tough, made of titanium and lightweight, and is sold by the Hev company. Guide bar maintenance. Guide bar problems in the bar rails are generally caused by incorrect chain tension, lack of lubrication, improper cutting technique, normal wear. Poor rail conditions. Blue discoloration. Splayed or pinched groove or incorrect depth. Wear just behind the nose. Chain tension. Turn the saw off. Wear protective gloves. Wait until the bar and chain have cooled before adjusting the tension. Recheck the chain tension at least every fuel cycle. Adjusting chain tension on the solid nose bar. Disengage the chain brake. Loosen the bar studs on the side of the saw. Pull the nose of the bar up and keep the nose up as you adjust the tension. Turn the guide bar's tension adjustment screw until the bottoms of the lowest tie straps and cutters just touch the bottom of the bar. Still holding the nose up, tighten the rear bar stud, then the front bar stud. Pull the chain by hand along the top of the bar several times from the engine to the nose. The chain should feel snug but pull freely. Daily guide bar maintenance. Remove the bar and chain for inspection and cleaning. Check the bar for wear, uneven rails, flared edges, cracks, damage requiring service. Clean the chain groove and oil holes. Start at the nose with the bar tool and clean toward the base. Oil holes must be clean. Sprocket nose should spin freely. Grease the roller tip. Daily chainsaw maintenance. Clean and rotate the bar each time you file the chain or at least once a day. Follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Remove and clean air filter. Take care not to damage the filter. Never use compressed air to blow out the filter. Follow the manufacturer's recommendations for cleaning and replacing. Check the muffler and spark arrestor. Replace spark arrestor screen if it has any holes. Power head. Inspect the power head for loose bolts and damage. Tighten the bolts or repair the power head if necessary. Check handlebars for loose bolts or cracks. Check dogs for loose or bent bolts. Check anti-vibration mounts. Look for cracks or damage. Excessive movement of the engine or a loose feeling when the saw is shaken indicates loose or broken mounts. Replace the guide bar and chain. Rotate the bar so that it wears evenly. Check for proper alignment of the bar with the bar studs, tension adjuster, and oiler. Check chain tension. Chain should be adjusted so that it doesn't hang from the bar but still turns freely. Check the chain brake to ensure it is operating properly. Inspect chainsaw safety features. Black Fastener switches and handles are on still chainsaws. Gray are the fastener switches and handles on Husqvarna saws. Inspect chain catch, inspect chain brake, inspect throttle lock system. Weekly chainsaw maintenance. Check the following. Shock absorption systems, clutch drum bearing, spark plugs, starter assembly, flywheel and cooling fins, muffler screen, carburetor body and cover.
Gapping. Ensure the spark plug is gapped if the saw is not running correctly. Storage. Drain and purge. Remove saw chain and guide bar. Cover the saw and store in a cool, dry place. Turn the saw monthly to redistribute oil. Sharpening cutters with a round file. Be sure the chain is tensioned properly. Maintain the correct top plate angle. Sharpen cutters on one side of the chain first. Keep the length of all cutters equal. Transporting chainsaws in a motor vehicle. Keep the bar and chain covered with the chain guard. Properly secure the chain to prevent it from being damaged and to prevent fuel from spilling. Never transport a chainsaw or fuel in a vehicle's passenger compartment. Transporting chainsaws when on foot. When carrying the saw for short distances, set the chain brake. When carrying the saw more than 50 feet, turn off the saw and carry it without touching the chain, muffler, and dogs. When carrying the saw on your shoulder, wear proper PPE and cover the bar and dogs. How chainsaws are carried. On animals, the bar is pointed toward the back away from the animal's neck and carried in Rubbermaid containers when possible fuel in MSR bottles to avoid burning the animal's skin if the fuel is spilled. On dirt bikes, chainsaws are usually carried in racks on the front or the back of the bike. Safe starting of chainsaws. Drop starting a chainsaw is strictly forbidden. Maintain a secure grip on the saw at all times. Always start the saw with the chain brake engaged. Start the saw on the ground or where it is firmly supported. Wedges are essential tools for safe felling and bucking. They provide a way to lift the tree, preventing the tree from sitting back when it is being felled. Wedges also reduce binds on the saw when bucking. Cant hooks and PVs used to move trees. Winching and rigging. Be sure that you are properly trained in the use of a winch or grip hoist before using one. Follow the procedures outlined in the JHA for the use of these tools. A grip hoist is often described as a come along on steroids. Fuel and oil containers. The most commonly used fuel and oil container is the two chamber Dolmore type safety container. Transport large quantities of saw fuel in an approved safety can. Leak proof bottles. Packers should carry fuel in leak-proof bottles and saws in rubber containers in order to prevent fuel from burning an animal's skin. Many other sawyers like to use these containers as well. Use a different colored bottle or paint to distinguish between fuel and bar oil. Fuel mixing. Follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Fueling a chainsaw. Allow the saw to cool for at least five minutes before refueling. Fill the saw on bare ground or on some other non-combustible grounded surface. Immediately clean up spilled fuel. Refuel outdoors and at least 20 feet from any open flame or other sources of ignition. Fueling a chainsaw. Fill the oil tank first, then the gas tank. Do not overfill the fuel or oil tanks. Hand tighten the fuel and oil tank caps. Be careful not to cross thread them. Do not start the saw closer than 10 feet from the fueling area.
Rider Down, Volunteers and Horses, a Facilitated Learning Analysis. Summary. On the morning of February 16, 2013, seven volunteers reviewed a job hazard analysis and set out on horseback to conduct a trail brushing project. The project was located on the Los Padres National Forest near the central coast of California. After a brief stop, one of the pack animals began to buck, broke loose from the wrangler, and ran through the other mounted riders. This caused the other animals to buck. A rider was thrown to the ground and suffered several broken bones and internal injuries. The injured rider was flown from the accident site to a local hospital via a medevac helicopter. To promote learning from unintended outcomes, the forest assigned an FLA team to review the accident and develop lessons learned to improve volunteer safety. The team was also charged with putting into practice the five tenets of the safety engagement, strategic risk, preparation, awareness, learning, and agreements. The volunteers were part of an organized equestrian group which works very closely with the forest. Ranking members of the group's leadership were present during the accident. The district has an active volunteer program and periodically trains project leaders to conduct work with other volunteers independent of Forest Service on-site presence. The project was planned for several weeks to take place over a three-day holiday weekend and was located beyond two Forest Service lot gates. Although this was the first time the leader was taking a group out on his own, two others in the party also received the training. The district outlined communications and safety protocol for volunteers, including pre-project approval, mandatory check-in and out procedures, and job hazard analysis review. Approximately two weeks prior to the event, the project leader and another volunteer scouted the trail and decided to change the plans of the project. During this trip, the pair did not use the check-in and check-out pro protocol. Some volunteers decided to arrive on Friday instead of the advertised Saturday start date. The volunteers did not check in or out of service on Friday. Lessons learned from participants. When I took the Forest Service training, we did not dive into radio use too deeply. Perhaps I could have asked for more information and kept the training package with me on the ride. It had been about a year and a half since I used the radio last. It is not always clear to me if I am riding for the equestrian club or I am riding as a volunteer. In the future, I will seek to clear this up because in my mind, I do not always need to check in with dispatch or take a radio. Our club will work on setting some internal standards when we volunteer. We just want folks and animals to be conditioned for this type of work. Sometimes we have horses that are certain breeds, don't get along with others, are too green, etc. We don't always have a formal way to tell someone that for the safety of others, they cannot take their animal on this ride. We are going to look at this with our club to develop some standard operating procedures. On the morning of the accident, the volunteers began riding to the work site without a radio or satellite phone. Both radio and satellite phone were issued to the group prior to the event, but were left in one of the vehicles. It was observed that the animal that eventually broke free also showed signs of an unseasoned animal. The wrangler loaded the horse's soft panniers with rocks in an attempt to mellow the animal. He also let the panniers hang off the pack saddle without securing them from bouncing on the side of the horse. After the rider was injured, the project leader had no way to contact the forest dispatch, so he sent a rider back to the vehicle approximately one mile away to retrieve the communication devices. The leader was able to contact the satellite 911 provider who patched him into forest dispatch. During this time, dispatch also talked the leader through radio operations to find the frequency and appropriate tone. Once radio communications were established, the leader was able to advise dispatch of the incident status and eventual recovery. There seems to be a disconnect between what the agency believes is volunteer work and when volunteers believe they are actually performing work under an agreement. It also appears that the more familiar the volunteer is with the agency, the more relaxed this line becomes. It is vital to their safety that the distinction is made clear. This project was advertised as a trail brushing project with pack stock. In reality, some members used it as an opportunity to train new animals to pack. This mixed mission created issues for the group and caused them to stop to address the animal that instigated the bucking incident. Work projects should be made separate from teaching clinics. 
If volunteers are being used as a supplemental workforce, the agency should be welcoming them to our safety engagement sessions. Lessons learned from FLA team. As our workforce declines, volunteers become increasingly vital to our mission. Managers must weigh strategic risks. If the agency is not able to provide adequate oversight, then the ultimate safety of our volunteers may be in jeopardy. Managers should ask themselves, when was the last time I observed volunteers using or troubleshooting communication devices? Have I asked dispatch if our volunteers seem competent on the radio? Are they following established protocols? And if not, have I followed through to find out why? If I cannot have a Forest Service presence at the project, how much more risk does that add? Is more risk added when the project includes horses, ATVs, and chainsaws? Chronology of events. February 15, 2013, volunteers arrive at the camp. February 16, 2013, 09.30, equestrian group project leader called dispatch using satellite phone and went into service. Dispatch filled out overnight form and assigned an identifier to the group project leader. February 16, 1049. Dispatch receives patched in satellite phone call regarding a rider that had fallen off a horse. February 16, 1054. Dispatch contacted local EMS. February 16, 1102. Local EMS responded medevac ship to accident site. February 16, 1115. Project leader now has a radio. Dispatch walked him through the process of operating it. February 16, 1124. EMS medevac ship on scene. February 16, 1156. The patient was flown to the local hospital. Unit 4A Chainsaw Tasks and Techniques Handling, Bucking, Limbing, and Brushing and Slashing. Unit 4A Objectives. Define the proper procedure for handling a chainsaw. Describe the proper procedure and hazard assessment for bucking, including types of vines and bucking methods. Describe the proper procedure and hazard assessment for limbing. Describe the proper procedure and hazard assessment for brushing and slashing. Handling. Establish secure footing. Maintain a balanced stance. Don't overreach. Use legs, hips, and knees to turn. Use both hands. Don't cut when the throttle lock is engaged. The thumb should be wrapped around the handle as shown. Incorrect thumb placement can result in an injury due to loss of control during a kickback. Maintain cutting area control. Don't allow chain contact with rocks, dirt, or wire. Reactive forces. Kick back, pull in, push back. Bucking. Learn to use the saw's dogs as a pivot point when felling or bucking. Use a light touch on the dogs. They shouldn't be used to force the bar through the wood, but rather to act as a support for the saw. You should keep your throttle up, dictating how fast you let the chain eat through the wood by your front handlebar inputs, rather than by adjusting chain speed to cut faster or slower. Bucking. Situational awareness. Complete a hazard analysis. Do not exceed your ability. Bucking can be more dangerous than felling. Ensure the cutting area control. Make sure the guide bar is the proper length. Establish good footing. Swamp out. Situational awareness and complexity. Safety considerations and attitude. Am I exercising sound judgment and awareness? Is my attitude influencing me to go against my better judgment, gut feeling? Do I have all of the required PPE and sawing equipment to do the job safely? Am I in an unfamiliar environment and timber type? Do I watch out for my coworkers and the public?
it's good to develop a relationship with the public. And when you're working on trails, as trail users go by and stop to talk, give out your volunteer organization's business card. Encourage them to report anything unusual that they see on trail or anything they see that is hazardous. Encourage them to use social media and websites like Hike Lost Padres. Fortunately, UTMC received an email notification and photo of this tree from Damara Mullins, one of uh, the local trail users and now a surveyor for us. This trail runs alongside the George Bush tree and gets a lot of traffic. And when we arrived, we saw that it was just hanging by a thread. The public was pretending to pump iron like it was a barbell and taking selfies. We were able to just barely nick it with the chainsaw and it dropped. And we demonstrated to the public why it was not safe to stand underneath hazard trees like that. We also carry with us hazard tape to mark off any areas where we do not feel comfortable taking the tree down. That gives us a chance to report to forest fire and go get uh, help such as uh, from the local forest fire or call the assistant rec officer and make arrangements for forest fire to come over and take care of the tree. That's more easily done in non-wilderness than in wilderness. The go or no go checklist for chainsaw operations. Go no go questions. Is there a safe location where you can work without unacceptable exposure to hazards? Is the location clear from overhead hazards whether you are felling or bucking? Is the location clear of any threat from other trees that may be affected by your cutting? Does the location avoid risk to other people? When felling, is there a clear and unobstructed lay for the tree, or can you safely create a space for it? Is the intended lay appropriate for the lean of the tree? When bucking or limbing, is there a clear path where the cut material can go? Is the escape route adequate for felling? Is the escape route adequate when limbing or bucking? Will the escape route remain clear through any possible complications during felling or bucking? Can you develop a clear felling plan that allows an escape route that provides a margin of error? Are you confident you have the skill to safely and successfully complete the task? Plan the bucking cut carefully. Complete a risk analysis before bucking. Assess the area for overhead and ground hazards to be mitigated before beginning bucking. Overhead hazards. Branches that get hung up in trees that are loose are often called widow makers. Here on Albanita Trail, I chose to block off the trail and make a bypass because it was too dangerous of a cutting area. It was better to wait for winter to come and see what else it could knock down. Other ways to get rid of branches could be using your stock's lash rope to pull it out or a throw bag. Sometimes there's not a stuck branch that's up above, but if you just look above where you're cutting, you can see that there's dead branches that could fall due to being disturbed by your activity below, such as the tree on Yellow Jacket that was above a tree I was cutting. Yellow Jackets ticks, snakes, and scorpions stirring up deadfall. Whenever you're swamping, moving brush and trees, it's likely that you'll stir up critters. Yellow jackets is what I am most concerned about, particularly in the Marble Mountains, and I've learned not to hard tie my stock to trees because when they get attacked, it's very dangerous to try and untie them. I've had bacterial tick infection for months that was undiagnosed that caused high fever. I learned that when you have an embedded tick, it's good to follow up with a course of antibiotics and get medical help. Snakes and scorpions can cause problems. I know of one incident where a brush saw has cut a rattlesnake in half while the sawyer was brushing. So it's good to be aware of the surroundings and what critters could cause you harm. Size up the log for tension and bind and possible reaction after the release cut has been completed. Establish escape routes and clear any obstacles that might inhibit your escape. Cut slowly and observe the curve for movement that will indicate where the bind is. 
A log can have different types of binds at different places. Buck from the uphill side. Begin bucking by cutting the offside first. The offside is the opposite side from where you are. This allows you to be farther away from the forces of the log that are generated when the log separates. Insert wedges to prevent pinch. Determining bind four types. Normally, logs have a combination of two or more binds top, bottom, side, or in binds. With top binds, the compression is on the top. The force pushes down on the log because it is suspended on both sides. The top of the log experiences compression forces that are waiting to pinch your bar. If you cut too deep from the top, the kerf will close, pinching your saw. To avoid getting pinched, release compression, then release your tension. Cut your offside first to avoid having to stand close to the log when you make your release cut. Then cut down from the top, being cognizant of your kerf closing and trying to pinch your bar. Finish your cut from the bottom releasing the log. Make sure the area you plan to work in is safe before starting any bucking or limbing job. This includes looking for overhead hazards. Also check the offside for any obstacles. When bucking, watch your kerf to avoid getting your saw pinched. You can slide your bar back and forth in order to better feel the pressure the wood is exerting on your bar. Avoid pulling the saw up or down if the kerf closes. Instead, slide the saw past you, past your body, to avoid getting the bar stuck. On smaller trees, a slight rocking of the saw on both the top and bottom cuts can be used to cut the offside rather than three distinct cuts. Using a wedge to protect your saw is slightly more time consuming, but is the best way to avoid saw damage caused by getting pinched. As you continue to cut into the wood, pause occasionally to seat your wedge deeper. A 
a pie cut can be removed to allow slower movement of the tree. This is often recommended for new cutters. To more gradually and safely release the forces in bind situations, a pie cut can be used. Estimate how far you can cut before the kerf closes. You don't want to cut too deep and pinch your bar. Start to cut part of your pie. Watch your kerf and feel the pressure on the sides of your bar. Then cut your offside and finish from the bottom. Some areas insist on cutters using nothing but pie cuts when bucking. With bottom binds, the compression is on the bottom of the log or limb. Because the weight of the log is not supported on both ends, gravity will cause tension on the top, pulling the wood fibers apart, and compression on the bottom, pushing the wood fibers together. If you cut from the bottom too far up, the kerf will close, pinching the saw. If you cut from the top of a heavy log, or one under a lot of tension, the log can explode potentially causing the saw to fly back or throw chain. To allow a smoother, safer release, cut your offside first to limit how close you have to be to the log. Then make a partial cut on the compression side, the bottom in this case. Finish with the tension side, cutting from the top and prepare to step back. On smaller trees, a slight rocking of the saw on both the top and bottom cuts can be used to cut the offside rather than three distinct cuts. Still, make an effort to cut the offside to allow the tip to be exposed only as much as it needs to be on the release cut. If a log is heavily loaded, a face cut can be used to allow a slower, less explosive release. Side binds typically have a number of binds that can be challenging to read. Ensure you plan ahead using the correct sequence of cuts that provide the minimum exposure to the potential reactions of the often loaded log. Standing behind one of the pivot points while cutting with the bar in a more vertical orientation often limits your exposure. It also reduces the chances that you may get your bar stuck.
End bind occurs when a log is on a slope. A wedge is one way to deal with end binds. Another way is an old-time cross-cut technique that uses a stick which is slightly wider than your kerf. This stick acts like a rolling pivot point. As you cut through the wood with your saw, the roller edge follows your bar through the wood until the pivot point changes on the wood, allowing your saw to be pulled out of the cut at the bottom, while the roller edge gets pinched. End bind. If more than one cut is being made, Make the top cut first, or make the cut where the log has the least amount of weight above the cut. This reduces the end bind on the second cut. If you are cutting down directly from the top, use more plastic wedges around the cut, especially as it progresses below the center line of the log. This reduces the possibility of binding. Many loggers have been hurt when bucking blowdown. These are trees that have fallen over with their root wads attached. They are dangerous because they can stand back up. When bucking blow down, it's critical to calculate how much of the log can be cut off before the base of the tree potentially stands back up. People have also been killed by being underneath the root ball when the base of the tree stands back up. Redistributing weight. Trees will sometimes stand up when cut, especially when heavy root balls are attached. In both of these photos, the trees were down on the trail when cut. They can act like large spring poles when weight is released. Safe bucking practices. Warn workers who are in and below an active cutting area, particularly on switchbacks. Run flagging tape across mountain biking trails in order to slow or stop approaching bikes. You will not hear them coming. Place crew members as lookouts and have the public leash their pets. Look before releasing a large tree that will roll. Give warning to others. To allow bucked chunks of bigger logs to be rolled out more easily, buck at angles so the chunks can be easily rolled out. Ensure no one is standing downhill of the piece that is being cut. Wedges can also be a useful tool with this technique. After some basic bucking skills have been developed, boring to buck can be an efficient technique to add. This cut allows you to use gravity in order to more efficiently cut the bottom portion of the log. It is also handy when there is little clearance under the log. To make a successful boring cut, start by cutting only with the lower one half of the tip, or what is known as the attack portion of the tip. To make boring cuts smoother, moderate your forward pressure and keep your chain speed very high to reduce friction and chattering. A slight, constant twist of the handlebar can aid in keeping the saw from chattering. It is critical to keep a solid grip on the saw with this cut. Keep your thumb fully wrapped 
and do not change your grip while cutting. Another way to finish your cut is to stand up and just cut with your tip. This requires you to have some good tip awareness skill. You can monitor the color of your sawdust to determine what's left to cut. Points to remember. Do a complete size up. Identify the hazards and establish escape routes and safe zones. Use rocks, stumps, or sound trees for protection. Reevaluate vines. Limbing. Check for overhead and ground hazards. Check for objects on the ground. Limbing. Maintain a firm grip. Identify the direction the log may roll. Identify the limbs that are supporting the tree's weight. Limb one side out to the top before turning around and limbing the other side on the way back as appropriate. Be aware of kickback potential. Even when limbing, check for overhead hazards and clear your work area to ensure you have a clear path to step back from the reactive forces of your cut. When possible, start at the top end of the tree for your bucking. Limbing can happen either direction, but ensure you are not crossing over your body with the chainsaw. Check for a good clear spot to make your cuts. Cutting a limb under tension can have explosive and dangerous reactive forces. For each limb you plan on cutting, identify what type of bind the limb has and how much tension it has. If there is a lot of tension, use a relief cut on the tension side. Even the OHV trails should be cut for stock use. Branches that stick out below and above are extremely hazard to stock, particularly pack animals, where the pack or rope gets caught on the branch and causes terrible accidents. Spring poles. Spring poles are limbs or small trees that are bent over and are under extreme tension. People have been killed by the explosive forces in spring poles. Spring poles regularly cause sawyers to throw their chain, and they can have catastrophic effects if cut wrong. The outside of the branch has tension forces with stored energy trying to rip apart the fibers, sending your saw flying. The fibers on the inside of the branch are being crushed together, waiting for you to get your bar pinched. If you just cut through from the inside, your bar can get pinched, your chain can be thrown, or the branch can violently explode. Respect the potential forces of these often small branches. Gradually relieve the pressure by cutting a notch out from the inside of the spring pole. Avoid going too deep and causing loaded wood fibers to be on the inside of your bar. Now release the tension by cutting from the opposite side of the branch. Be patient. 
Avoid cutting too deep at one time and allowing wood to push on the inside of your bar. This often throws chains or pinches bars. Another way to release this pressure, although not as smooth, is to make a series of cross grain cuts to relieve some compression, then finish from the other side. Suspended tree. When a tree is suspended off the ground, carefully select the appropriate technique, such as limbing from the ground, limbing on top, or lowering the tree by bucking. An accordion cut takedown method utilizes a series of face cuts while preserving hinge wood to maintain control. The angle that you cut will dictate the direction that the weakened pieces move. Take into account which way you want the top to move when choosing where you place your face cuts. It's critical to select the proper height to make your cuts when chunking down a hung up tree. If you cut too high, the cut chunk can swing away from you causing the top to fall back in your direction. By selecting the correct angle to make your cut, you can often direct which way the base of the cut chunk slides. In turn, this can help you manage which way the top of the cut chunk moves to get out of a hung up situation. Notice how the Sawyer constantly analyzes the kerf, either visually or by feeling it by sliding the saw back and forth in order to judge the resistance. An adequate escape route is always needed before each cut is started. Avoid getting impatient and making your cuts too high. Only expose as much bar as you need to into the tree, especially on your release cut. This keeps you farther away from the tree. When chunking down, let gravity pull the saw into your cut. Anticipate the curve closing and slide the saw out past you when pulling it out, not back up. Then line your bar up at least one kerf lower so the cut chunk slides past your bar. Brushing and slashing, size up and safety. Be sure the chain has stopped before moving to the next cutting location. Engage the chain brake when moving even short distances. Shut the saw off before moving farther than from tree to tree. When slashing, felling trees smaller than 5 inches in diameter, an undercut may not be needed. Always escape or retreat from the stump quickly, even when felling small diameter trees. Be alert for kickbacks. Communicate intentions to the swamper. Maintain proper stance. Drop hazard trees to the ground so no one has to work under them if qualified to do so. Watch out for whipping limbs, flush cut, stobs. Do not cross your hands over on the chainsaw handles. Never cut with the chainsaw above shoulder height. When cutting small trees, cut the stumps as close to the ground as possible. Cut pieces small enough to be easily handled. With brushing smaller bars that have proper chain tension and keeping high chain speed will reduce the chance of throwing chain and kickback. Chain breaks should be used if taking more than two steps or pulling brush out of the way. If you have a swamper, set up a system of communication and move your bar out of the way when they need to pull brush. Generally,
try to make their job as easy as possible by moving out of their way so they can clear the cut material and cutting pieces into appropriate sizes. There are a number of methods to fall trees smaller than about five inches that don't require three cuts. A kerf undercut involves two cuts. A small single cut that acts as a face cut followed by a back cut. As with all cutting, ensure you low stump your stobs to reduce the risk of injury from people falling on them. A different method is a slanting cut. This doesn't allow for as much directional control, but can be effective on trees that have definite leaning. Many people use a twist in their bar to help tip these trees after they cut full depth, but this can be very hard on bars and should not be done with reduced weight bars. Small green trees can be partially cut, then pushed over. Only the sawyer should be doing the pushing with this cut. Having a swamper push them over is a dangerous habit. Subject, firefighter injured while pulling brush for chainsaw operator. Accident date, 6 4 at 1300 p.m. On the afternoon of June 4, 2010, an engine crew was brushing their station PT trail using various hand and power tools, including a chainsaw. As the chainsaw operator was working on a patch of sagebrush, the fire engine operator, FEO, approached him from uphill. The FEO reached into the sagebrush to assist the sawyer by pulling brush and made contact with the tip of the saw. The FEO received a laceration to his right index finger requiring four stitches. Summary. The engine crew was lined out on three projects for the day by the FEO supervisor. The first project was to brush the trail and the FEO gave a tailgate safety talk to the crew regarding the project. At the time of the incident, the crew was working on a 15% slope with the FEO flagging the trail route ahead of the Sawyer. He had taken his gloves off to hang the flagging. Weather conditions were in the low 90s. Timetable. 0930, the engine crew comes on duty. 1000, the crew conducts morning station and engine maintenance. 1100, the crew is briefed on the projects, receive tailgate safety talk, and begins brushing and scraping the PT trail. 1300, the crew was working through several steep areas and was very close to the project completion. Conditions, three of the crew members had been doing fuels work throughout the winter and had signed a job hazard analysis, JHA, that included working with power saws. The other two seasonal members had not reviewed or signed a JHA. The tailgate talk included personal protective equipment, PPE, medical evacuation procedures, and designating a crew member to bring a 10-person first aid kit. Only the Sawyer was wearing chaps and PPE for proper saws. The Sawyer had been pulling the brush for himself for the duration of the project, and no other puller was designated. The crew as a whole had been together for less than a month, and this was the first trail line construction project they had attempted. Lessons learned from the participants. It was getting warm, and I could see the guys were getting tired, but we were so close to finishing, I thought if I would lend a hand to the pulling, we could make a quick push to the end. Looking back, I guess I got a little mission-focused or target-fixated and stepped out of my big-picture leadership role and into a participate role. I am very lucky it was only a few stitches and that I had a good crew around me with a plan to get off that hill. If the cut were more serious wrist area, I might not be here to talk about it. The guys jumped right into their roles as first responders and all of a sudden that 10 person first aid kit became the most important thing we had. I know how to approach a working sawyer. You touch their back on whatever sides you're helping on or you wait for their acknowledgement before you reach in. I thought he saw me as I came downhill to help him but with his head down and me uphill, obviously I was wrong. Maybe I should have assigned a puller with full PPE, but for sure I should have been wearing mine. I will never sacrifice safety for saving time again. I had been pulling for myself all morning, and the last time I looked up, the FEO was about 25 feet above me hanging flagging. The next thing I knew, he was right in front of me. We both pulled back, but it was too late, and I had cut him. Maybe I could have looked up more often. 
When the FEO made a role change from Line Scout to Puller, the transition did not include proper communications or PPE additions. This change should have included the Sawyer's full acknowledgement in putting on ear protection, chaps, and gloves. The sense of urgency for the FEO to push to the top before the crew got too tired caused him to lose situational awareness by engaging the Sawyer without PPE or an acknowledgement. The permanent employees felt comfortable about the project and recently remembered covering a power saw JHA during spring RX projects. Leaders must remember to revisit JHAs with newly hired seasonal employees. Our leaders should always consider their roles, lead by example with PPE, even in project work, when they step out of a supervisory role and into participant role, this scenario can quickly turn into a watch out. The crew did an outstanding job by discussing serious injury evacuations during the tailgate session and had excellent forethought by bringing the 10-person first aid kit. The kit met requirements for working with power saws under 29 CFR 1910.266E2, Appendix A. Keyholes. When forest fire cuts fire line, they create keyholes by cutting away pockets of brush. Volunteers also cut keyholes when there's nowhere to throw brush in dense areas. Cut brush needs to be kept together in piles, not thrown about. It should be moved out of sight as much as possible and well off the trail. On slopes, keep it on the downhill side to prevent it from blowing back onto the trail later. A chainsaw or clearing saw, sometimes called a brush saw, can be used on non-wilderness trails. We often still use non-motorized tools such as loppers on non-wilderness trails when there are not enough certified volunteers available. The PPE is the same for both saws, with the exception of chaps being optional to the clearing saw operator. Chaps may protect you from rocks and other debris that may be flung back. They do not stop the saw or prevent you from being cut by the blade on a clearing saw. Chainsaw or clearing saw. A chainsaw may be carried on a dirt bike and is more lightweight, whereas a clearing saw may be carried easily on pack stock and likely carried a few miles by hikers. A chainsaw is less expensive to purchase and operate. A clearing saw runs well over $1,000. The purchase cost is several times that of a chainsaw. The blades average $16 a day. A chainsaw leaves a choppier look to thinner brush in particular. A clearing saw leaves a cleaner look to the trail and cuts all brush well and lower to the ground. A chainsaw is more tiring to operate, especially since you're bending over. A clearing saw uses a harness. The operator does not tire as quickly and gets more cut. A chainsaw requires certification, whereas a clearing saw does not. This tree was followed by forest fire in wilderness during a fire. An attempt was later made to make the chainsaw cuts look more natural by beveling the edges of the fallen trees and their stumps. What do you think? Try to make your cuts not stand out and detract from the visitor's experience. Initials put on the end of the trees detract from the experience, years, etc. It's best to leave those off. Whether it be wilderness or non-wilderness, the idea is the same. Strive to keep stumps below 10 inches. Renegade sawyers often leave high stumps on trails and their untrained work needs to later be improved for aesthetics. Flush cut limbs for appearance and for safety, particularly for pack stock that may catch those limbs. Limbing safety. Identify these safety infractions. Earplugs not on. Thumb not wrapped. No room to step back. Power head above shoulders, blocked escape route. Tripping hazards, work area not cleared. Tip, kickback potential. Improper technique for spring pull. Area not cleared for escape routes. Bucking safety, vehicle too close. No gloves, no chaps. Bucking downhill, blocked escape route. Overhead hazards, limb the log first, no escape route. 
standing on logs. Operational leadership. One, take charge. Two, motivate. Three, demonstrate initiative. Four, communicate. And five, supervise. Take charge. You, as the Sawyer, need to establish control of everyone who could be affected by your chainsaw operation. Take charge. What would you do if your supervisor came into your cutting area and demanded that you clear a tree that you are not comfortable with? Motivate. Motivate yourself and others to actively embrace safety, incorporate good cutting practices, and lead by example. Demonstrate initiative. Regardless of whether or not anyone is watching, ensure that you are cutting within your qualification level. Communicate. Ensure there is effective two-way communication. Take the time to communicate intent and solicit feedback from swampers, other sawyers, supervisors, and adjoining resources. Supervise. Your crew is nearing the end of the day and you only have 100 feet of trail left to brush out. In an effort to finish the job sooner, your swamper starts to reach in while you are still actively cutting brush. What would you do? Communicate. You notice your supervisor bucking trees out of the road and see that he didn't take time to put chaps on. What do you do? Supervise. Ensure safety and provide purpose, direction, and motivation. You may not be a supervisor, but you can still be a leader. I was torn between knowing that I should not cut the tree alone and not wanting to bother the Forest Service with large fires now breaking out on the district. I also knew that this major access road needed to be kept open in the case the public needed to evacuate the area. It was unlikely that the road would see any other traffic that day. I called in to Fortuna Dispatch, and my assistant rec officer, Chris Trunkey, was contacted. He was there within the hour, and although taken from the fire, he assured me that the no-go decision was correct. I should not cut the tree alone. We cleared the road. Later, my trail crew foreman saw the tree and reinforced that I had made the right decision. I've always been supported by the Forest Service when making no-go decisions. At times, I ask Forest Fire to assist me in the field when I am uncomfortable with the complexity of a tree. It is important as trail maintainers to foster cooperation between trail user groups. Combined trail maintenance projects set a positive example for community behavior that works to reduce user conflict. As temporary Forest Service employees, it is inappropriate to use trail maintenance as a political platform to promote special interests. In the photo on the left, we have a project with a packer cutting a tree up ahead while the mountain bikers lay their bikes down behind. In the center, a llama carries water and chainsaws on an OHV project. On the right, we have all four trail user groups, mountain bikes, motorcycles, stock users, and bikers all working the same trail together. 